Today I'm going to talk about how we enhance our client base. Uh, we stand out in front of a crowd, a very crowded space that we all work in today, and uh, why I think that proactive customer service is a new currency. But before that, let's have a look at some quick recent work. This first project is a wedding that we did in Malibu exactly a year ago this past weekend, and the client's directive to me was to do a wedding with no more, the, none of the guests more than 20 to 30 feet away from the bride and groom. And the funny thing is, they had been in a relation for six years, and I didn't realize that it designed the art to look like a question mark. <laughs> but it was a very beautiful wedding, wonderful and intimate. We had this cantilever literally over the water in Malibu. Love that magical moment of rose petals falling on top of bride and groom. And then we made our way up to cocktails. I love this idea of working with ice as one of our themes, whether it was flowers and caviar. And then we made our way for dinner. And this is a very beautiful contemporary home that also boasts the longest privately owned residential swimming pool in California. So I couldn't put up a tent with big poles and, and lines and things. So I built this out of a, a truss structure, which we covered in fabric, and put it right next to the edge of the pool. So you either had an incredible view of a thousand candles, or if you were faced on the other side, you have a tremendous view of the ocean. And there was that magical moment when you know, the candles come alive, the dust starts to take its effect. And I also like the idea of putting a lamp underneath the table, it kind of gets it to glow beautifully. And Wolfgang Puck presided over our dinner. This is that favorite moment I talk about when the wine's taken its effect and the candles are burned halfway down, and everyone's got a smile wrapped two and a half times around their face. That's why we do what we do, right? And then we brought out Christina Aguilera to give us three songs and get us in the mood for the nightclub. And they also, like me, are complete James Bond fans. So I made for a wonderful entrance into a nightclub that we built. This is what we call the Colin Cowboy 120 mile an hour cocktail. It's equal parts of tequila, espresso, and tea maria shaken very cold, guaranteed to keep you in the dance for at least for another hour. <laughs> and then we made our way into Club SK, as in Sarah and Kurt elevated us so we had this beautiful underlit dance floor and once again just a truss structure stretched with navy blue chiffon so this idea of having a space within a space that was intimate with this beautiful elevated ceiling we built an incredibly chic dj stand a well-stocked bar to keep us well fueled for the night and of course i think this was the bride's seventh dress that night she kind of changed between courses literally and DJ Khaled was in the house with DJ Ruckus, along with Puffy Combs, and this went at about, I think, five, six o'clock in the morning, when things got a little messy. And then I love Neon, I think it's kind of fun, so this was a gift that they now have in their home. Uh, this wedding we did three weeks ago in Massachusetts, you know, the weather there in New York is kind of the same as the weather here, and we were blessed with extraordinary weather. This is the Edith Wharton estate, and she got to live 10 years of her life before coming to live in France. Magnificent gardens. Well, for New York places, because standing around you has a whole different story, right? So there's a beautiful ceremony in the round. I would think that a well-informed guest is a happy guest. Made our way up for cocktails. And then a beautiful walk up to a dinner marquee, which is a real classic fairy tent. Nadia was like this beautiful garden theme that we created. And I just loved this color scheme. This was a very unusual bride. She couldn't make up her mind about anything. And eventually we were able to like extract this out of her. So it was kind of fun and clean. There were linens all over the tables. It wasn't over the top, but kind of a little bit more restrained, a bit more of a Scandinavian feel to it. Love that idea of all the orange and the black. My favorite moment. And now we're going to take you to California. Uh, this is a campfire dinner that we did for Oprah Winfrey at her home. And I created these three beautiful teepees that we use for our food stations and our bars. You can see the height of them is probably about 35 feet each. And surrounded the pool with the same thousand candles that I used the year before. <laughs> Those dirty operated candles, I love them. They never burn down and they never go out. But our journey started in the woods. This is part of her redwood forest. We received your, your name on the left, or a piece of terracotta tile. The whole idea was about a campfire. On the right-hand side, we covered the furniture in moss, and we served molecular shots. 
So this just to like get the taste buds going. I think one was tequila and the other was vodka. Always pick your name, don't get them mixed up. Yeah. And I love the idea of integrating everything so it looked completely natural, using natural materials, lots of moss, lots of exposed wood. I love the idea of working with cloches, with five flowers on the table. And it's so cool, there's nothing worse, it's like a grilled cheese sandwich, there's nothing worse than a cold grilled cheese sandwich, right? It's the same thing as a got fake with some, they were making them fresh right in front of you. Nice and crispy, they were still warm from the fryer. And then, of course, with the creature comforts, you always want to make sure that there's a pashmina should you get all too cool. This is our dinner, served between the trees. I wanted to keep it very intimate, so there's no more than six people per table. And this is a beautiful ode to fall, also about a year ago. My favorite DJ, DJ Colm, he's like my American Express card. I never leave home without him. <laughs> I just love this magical moment. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And then we took a little walk. Over here, from here. We took a walk down to the amphitheater where John Bon Jovi performed a couple of songs for us. And then we finished off with Alicia Keys. Come as far. Heard us all in the moment. And then there come my espresso tequila shots. And then just as we have a grand entrance, we have a beautiful grand exit as well. So right, let's talk about the business of why we're all here today. How do we enhance our customer base? I think today in Generation X, so Generation Z and the Millennials, want to know that we are very specialized. That idea of us having our arms around 20 different industries and only too many lanes, doesn't sit well with them. They want to know that they've come to someone who owns their lane. That's why I think it's important that you should be able to describe in 15 words or less exactly what it is that you're doing in your business. So we're in the business of creating bespoke luxury experiences. Doesn't matter if we're creating an event, working with a bride and groom, or we work with one of our hospitality partners or licensing partner. And it's all about creating that bespoke experience. I think that we all agree with me today that the world is completely oversorted in all areas. We really don't need another anything, right? It's about knowing which 98% to say no to, to find 2% to help you tell a really good story. And as we can see what's happening in the world today, the luxury base of bespoke services is doubling and tripling and quadrupling in size. However, the consumer base is not growing in direct proportion. So either you have to be the very best at what you can do, so you can charge the most, and charge what you're worth, and charge what you deserve, or you're going to end up cost-cutting and price-slashing to get the piece of the pie that you can to pay your payroll and to pay your rent at the end of the month. And it's kind of a sad area where we go to, because if we don't protect our intellectual property of who we are and what we charge, this is a quick race to the bottom of the hill. How many of you find that all your competitors are slashing prices and cutting costs to take a job from you? Right? Every one of us. It happens to me. I go in, I, 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 I bid for an incredible project, someone's ready to sign on the dotted line, and then all of a sudden Susie Smith down the road, who's got her pop-up laptop and her pop-up shop, and the ink hasn't even dried on her business card, and she's got a lovely URL with beautiful pictures, is now my competition. And she's been in business for three months, and I've been in business for 30 plus years. So we have to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, so the client knows exactly who we are and what we do, and how do we stand out in front of a crowd. I think experience is the most overused word today in the English vocabulary, but it's what we're all trying to do, right? But it's only a good word when you can put the word authentic in front of it. When you can put the word authentic in front of an experience, it means you can't create it anywhere else. It can't be made out of a drawing room. It's real, right? And I think there's so much bad out there, there's so much fake out there, that when you can create something authentic, you'll be able to do something that sets you apart from everybody else. And I think this is important. My friend Maya Angelou, bless her soul, said, people will forget what you say, people will forget what you do, but no one will ever forget how you make them feel. Right? And I think that's important, because if you want to buy a world today with Generation Z and the Millennials, you have to create an emotional connection. If you don't create that emotional connection, 
you're just going to become another product and they're going to sort their way through more product to find something else. So the idea of being able to create a connection with your customer, your consumer, your guest, is what you're going to use to be able to seduce them and to get them to stay with you. That's why I use the sensors. You know, if you look at my work, no two projects ever look the same, because I always start with that couple's DNA and we build upon it. I call it seducing your customer. When it comes to seducing my customer, my tongue is out to here. Okay? I've never worked harder. I used to close 80% of all prospects who walked into my office. We closed 80% of the deals. Today we close 50% of the deals. And we really, really do our homework. We make sure that we've Googled the client, we know what they look like. There's an intern waiting downstairs on the street outside the door that can visually identify Mrs. Smith at 10 feet, make a smile, and five feet put out her hand to shake her hand. We then bring them up in the elevator, they come into the conference room, they see it in seat A and B so that they can look through the glass window into our beautiful chic lobby and think, I have arrived. This is a stylish, elegant place. Their name's on the screen behind us. We have gift bags ready for them to take when they leave. We have open wine, champagne, and red wine and white wine. I always take my meetings between 4 and 6 o'clock in the evening because something happens in that magical hour with a cocktail. Right? You get them to have more fun. And then when they see the macarons on the table with their names and initials on them, the even goes all further. So we really work hard. When they come to have a presentation in our office, it's showtime. And we do whatever we can to make sure that we seduce the customer, right? And close the line. I think it's important that we edu educate the clients, that they understand the caliber of our work, they understand what it is that we do, they understand why we're worth it, make it known that you have been in business for 30 plus years. If you have an office, bring them into your office. Have them meet the people around you so they understand you're not just a team of one, that there's a support team around you. And the other thing I like to do is I also like to create a critical path with every single one of my customers. The day that we sign the contract, I don't call them contracts because I think it's too hard of a word. The day we sign an agreement with them, because now it's an engagement of three, I'm now engaged as well. And then we give them a critical path so they know every single thing that happens till the day they walk down the aisle. And this way they never think, have they thought of this? Are they going to do this? Are they going to do the next thing? It comes down the line and they have a very smooth journey. So I want to talk about service. I think this is the most important thing today. There are two types of service in the world. There's proactive service and there's reactive service. When we look at reactive service, this is probably what 95% of the world's service providers create. When something goes wrong, you put up your hand. And if it's fixed correctly, you can buy customer loyalty and you can move on. It's the easy way to provide service, right? It's the lazy way to provide service. But if you really want to blow away the customer and you really want to make a difference, you need to do proactive service. So only 5% of people can deliver proactive service. Because what is proactive service? Proactive service is how do we anticipate the unanticipated needs of the, of the guest? or the customer, or the consumer? How do we get to think about what they would anticipate before it actually happens? And that's when it gets kind of fun. That's when you can start to Google them and find out what's their favorite color, what do they drink, right? So that's kind of this caption. Now, how do you deliver it? With incredible personalization. People like to see their names. People like to see the names written. They like to see the initials embroidered on a piece of linen. It's how you make them feel. It's how you create that emotional connection with someone. So the idea of personalization is how we communicate, how we connect with you, and then of course attention to detail. When you show extreme attention to detail to what you do, people notice, people make a big difference. It's all about how we execute and how we set ourselves apart. I always then tell everyone in my team, the word elegant is a very powerful word. And when you put the word elegant in front of any other word, it naturally elevates the service, it naturally makes it better, it naturally makes it far more appealing. So you can walk and you can walk elegantly, and you can talk and you can talk elegantly, you can party and you can party elegantly. So it adds that sort of elegance to everything that you do and the service quality will naturally rise. None of this happens without teamwork and communication. Teamwork and communication are the brothers and sisters of success. You cannot provide good service unless the teams are working very well together. If you have silos and people aren't communicating, you can't set one another up for success. 
but to provide proactive service, you're always looking for opportunity, looking for opportunity to find that touch point so that you can make a difference. So that comes from communicating with your team and having all the right protocols in place to set you up for success. I'm going to share with you my most important tool is actually the last slide. So if teamwork and communication of brothers and sisters are success, the other two are without a doubt standards, right? And consistency. How many times have you gone to a restaurant and you had a great experience, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you told all your friends about it. You went on Sunday evening with a new group of friends, it wasn't so good, right? You just lost confidence. So if you're going to deliver service, it's only when you deliver service consistently that you'll get through. Now, the two times that you don't deliver it consistently are the two times when you let everybody down. So consistency is of key importance there, and the same thing, you can't have consistency without standards. What are the standards? The standards are the protocols by which we live our businesses, and they're the, the maps and the guides that keep us moving forward. So I used to be the creative director for NetJet. This is before the market crashed. It was a wonderful opportunity. I never got on a commercial aeroplane in four years, and I used those planes like a yellow taxi. And one of the things I realized when I created the customer education program and the customer service program was I was dealing with pilots and flight attendants who were protected by the toughest union in the United States. These were people who all thought they were God and they weren't interested in listening to anyone. And the only way I got through to them was doing pilots like lists. So I came with this idea of the three fives. So if we can apply the three fives to how I started my conversation earlier this, this, this morning, was the three fives that set us all up for success. These are three things or five things. So the three fives are five things you do before, five things you do during, and five things you do after. So like the, 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 in this instance, for instance, let's talk about how we prepare for getting a client. Five things, you would Google the client and do your research. You'd set up the conference room. You'd make sure it's personalized. You'd make sure that you've got your gifts ready for the clients to go up. And you make sure that your team has got your screen presentation ready to go on the slide machine, right? And then for the five things that happen while we're in, in, in the conference room with them, we make sure that they're greeted. We make sure that they get to meet everybody in the room. We make sure that they get a beautiful beverage. We take them through a presentation of how we work. And then finally, one of the five things we do afterwards. The moment the clients in the elevator and gone downstairs, we sit and we regroup. How does that go? Right? Who's going to send the next follow-up letter, the next follow-up email? And then setting the conference room up for the next time. So there's three files of everything you do. And if you take these three files and apply them to any protocol in your business, you'll get ready, you'll execute it wonderfully, you'll learn from it, and you'll set yourself up for success the next time. So just to regroup on this whole little story of customer service, we want to be proactive as possible, right? So we're really looking for opportunity to anticipate those unanticipated needs. We want to show exceptional attention to detail. We want to make sure that it's personalized so we create that emotional connection, we buy some loyalty. We want to add that sort of elegance to everything and realizing that without teamwork and communication, we can't make this work. And if you have great consistency, you'll have great consistency because you've got good protocols in place and good standards in place. And that is how we make a difference. James, I think I'm completely on time and on schedule. I think we've got 10 minutes for questions, right? We, we do, yes. If any questions, call in. Uh, can we bring the mic down, please? Good morning, Colin. Good morning. I'm Audrey from uh, Audrey Amity's Weddings. First of all, thank you very much indeed for your talk. Extremely informative, extremely helpful. I have one question, please. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your background? I think you were born in Ketwe, uh, Zambia. Yes, I was born in Central Africa, in Zambia, in Ketwe, and uh, educated in South Africa. I didn't believe in apartheid, and I thought it was a very unfair system, so the height of apartheid. I left South Africa, all our bank accounts were monitored and closed. I arrived in Los Angeles with $400, one very well cut suit, an omnipresent tan and big dreams. <laughs> and I haven't stopped. And I still feel like, I still feel like I'm just starting out. It's, a, it's been an amazing journey. I feel so privileged and, 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 and happy and, and lucky to be able to work with the people that I work with around the world, making magic. That's what we do. We're storytellers. So 14 and a half million miles and 100 countries later, I'm just getting started. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, but in fact, I was wondering, what, is your, what was your break in the industry? Really, the day when you thought... I remember it so clearly. 
I was teaching cooking lessons at the Beverly Hills High School adult program, in other words, the mothers, okay, to make extra money to pay my rent. And there was one lady in the room whose husband was the president of Playboy. And she said, would I be a food consultant because Hugh Hefner was getting married? And I went up to the Playboy mansion and they had Mexican stations and they wanted to make it black tie and they had a silver lame ceiling. It was so bad, I can't begin to tell you. So I gave them my vision, not as from a food point of view, but how the whole thing should be. And every time I told the story, it got bigger and better and someone more important came down and eventually I was staying in front of Hugh Hefner in his pajamas at three o'clock one afternoon. And uh, he told me, can you do this? The wedding was in 12 weeks time. I said, absolutely, I had no clue what I was going to do. <laughs> And it remains probably, probably one of the best events I've ever produced. And I remember driving down in my little convertible VW in the corner of Beverly Hills and, uh, and Sunset Boulevard. There was a payphone, and I called my mother reverse charges to tell her, I think I just made it. And that was my first big job. Yeah. Anybody else with a question? Yes. Hi, good morning. And again, thank you so much for... Um for that talk. Um, my question is, you, you talked about being able to Google your clients, finding out who they are before the, the meeting. So what about us who don't have clients that we can Google um, in order to get some more insight into them? How did you manage that before you were able to do that with your clients? Well, we love Google and we hate Google, right? Because if there's anything bad, it's like the cream, it rises to the top, right? <laughs> so, does, so, does, so does the scum, right? <laughs> what I've heard before. So you, I found Google has been a great resource. Google also screwed all of our businesses, right? We used to make so much more money because the client never knew where to find the band or the florist or that magician. So we could market whatever we want. Now all of a sudden Google has given access to everyone and they know where to find and what to pay for. So I would then go to a friend, ask how did you find out about me, and do as much homework as you can. You know, when I spoke about attention to detail, we have an alarm on our website that when someone calls for an inquiry, within one hour, that phone call is, respond, is, is, is returned. If a phone is given, we call immediately or we respond by email. So it's you know, being as resourceful as you possibly can because if you don't do it, someone else is going to do it. Well, anybody else? Yes. Hi, given what James was saying about charging, from the start, do you make people pay for to come and have this presentation that you do? I mean, how do you handle that? No. So, that's why I said it's the seduction, right? We're dating. We're dating for 45 minutes. I'll get you in my office for 45 minutes to an hour. It's to do as much as I can because I know for a fact you're going to speak to five other people. It's like doing my best job possibly. Um, we do the presentation for free and then we get engaged and we decide I have three different products because I started losing so much business because of the Oprah Winfrey effect. You know, she had been on the show 27 times. And she said, Colin hired five jumbo jets to fly in the equipment to the Middle East, needed 14,000, this and 100,000, and all of a sudden people said, We can't afford you. So I had people that were coming to me saying, Well, you know, the market's not so good right now. Ronald, looks bad if you came to the wedding as a guest, would you mind not doing my daughter's wedding? If you'd like, what's a good bank to pay? So what we did was we bifurcated our products. So if you look on our website, you'll notice there's three distinct different products that we sell. So there's our Colin Cowie White, which is our haute couture, three and a half million dollars and up. It's completely made to measure. It gives you access to places and things nobody else would. Then we've got Signature column, which is my personal services, obviously. That's a budget from about $750,000 and up. And we charge a design fee, which is anywhere from $35,000 in New York to $100,000 out of the country. And in the Middle East, when we're presented, we're going to steal my idea. It's $250,000, because there's a good chance I might not get it back. So, and then on top of that, we charge 20%. And of course, there's many ways to negotiate. If somebody doesn't want to pay that, but they still want signature columns, I could waive the design fee or part of the design fee and stay in that realm. If that's still too expensive, we have what's called Team Cowie, which is cost of goods plus 18%. It comes from the exact same design team and it gives us the ability to have a competitive product without losing those first two tiers. And the good thing about that, if someone says it's still too steep for me and I still have rent to pay, I could say, okay, we'll take 
18% on the first 150,000, 17% on the next 100,000, and you can step it down and then cap it at a certain number. But we're all leaving far too much money on the table. When the client convinces you to go from 20% to 15%, there's all these different incantations in the middle that you can keep a little bit more of the profit. Because if we don't protect our profits, Okay, none of us are going to get rich in this business. We're going to live a lovely life, take a couple of vacations, dress designer, but we won't achieve the financial goals that we need to achieve. So there's so many areas, other areas that you can do. Do you charge a day off, day off site? On the, on, on the job site, we charge for all of our labor. So for instance, a senior producer would, or the executive producer would be billed out at 12.50 a day, an associate at 1,000 a day, a design assistant at 7.50 a day, and PAs at 6.50 a day. So put that in there as well. If the client gives you pushback, you can say, well, I need the two top producers, but I'll give you a break on the other three. So there's so much left on the table. The one other thing we do, the real, real, real bottom line, before the bottom line, we charge 1% as the administration fee. Because it allows us to say, this covers our general overhead for our office and our administration. So there's all these areas where we can keep money into the, into the, into the, the, the mix and not just discount our services so heavily, so quickly, because the consumer has never been more savvy. It's a buyer's world out there, right? So we need to figure out how to engage them in a meaningful way and make the profits that we deserve, because I don't know anyone in any in industry that works harder than we do. Yes, see, see. My divine friend, whose office is right across the road from me, like literally from here to there. Yes, you are. It's so painful. You know how many times I'm like, oh my God, they love us. We still have this deal. There's no question about it. You get that phone call four days and now we decided we're going to pair things down and we're going to buy a house instead and have a smaller wedding. So we get a lot of that. And you know, I think it's just the nature of the business today, working twice as hard for half the amount, closing 50% of the deals that we used to close. I think that's why we have to work that much harder. So how do we make the presentation? Usually, we know before the client comes into the office, are they white, color carry white, are they signature color, are they team carry? So we're able to speak accordingly and speak to that because we're not going to offer to take them dress shopping. We're not going to offer to do all the calligraphy, handhold them the way we do with signature column as we would with team gallery. So we make the proposal exactly the same way. And then the proposal basically is really is a, an agreement getting us involved. And then part of it's in person? No, it's email to them. It's oh, email. We email to them and then we follow up with a phone call afterwards and get them help to sign on the dotted line and send a check as quickly as possible. <laughs> right? And then once that's done, then we start the whole, and then the, 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 the design process is we started by creating a series of mood boards, an overall mood board for everything, a mood board for ceremony, for cocktails, for dinner, for dancing, for Sunday brunch. And we started fine tuning those mood boards. Simultaneously, we started to draw floor plans, elevations, started to pull fabrics, started to pull finishes and fixtures, and then we get ready for a creative presentation. And the creative presentation is always parked out on that critical part. It's something that the client pays for. It's either done in our office, in our conference room, with a larger project, we'll take it to maybe a hotel. But there they sit at every single table. In other words, if we're doing a 20-foot table, we do a six-foot section of that table, a round table, a square table. They get to feel the linen, the amount of starch on the linen. They get to see the embroidery. So there's no surprise when they get that big fall of your chair number at the end of the day. Huh? You have to talk numbers up front. You know, it's interesting. When I first started out in this business, I'd find the bride walking with a big flashy diamond ring. Like, God, that's rent my vacation and payroll for the next three months. And she'd talk about her love for caviar and champagne and Dom Perignon and limousines and rack of lamb. We'd have this wonderful conversation in big circles, then I'd ask her the budget. And all of a sudden, the rack of lamb became chicken stuffed with something. And all of a sudden, the Dom Perignon became shattered by the gallon. And the limousines became super shopper. So rather than set ourselves up and then be disappointed, one of the very first things we said, we need to have an idea, what is your comfortable number? 
What is the number you're willing to spend? And often you'll find that people refuse, they don't want to tell you the number. Yeah. You know? yeah. How do you get that out of me? You kind of say, you kind of say well, this is an age for three, I'm not on the other side of the fence, I'm here to help you. This is the first time you've done it. I've done this every day of my life for the last 30 plus years. I know what you should spend. If you give me your number, I will put it into a budget allocator that we have, whether it's a hotel wedding, a tented wedding, or, or, a, or a private space, and we will take your budget and tell you, this is what you should be spending on flowers, this is what we're spending on props and decor, this is what we're spending on food, and you can quickly find out if it's a comfortable number, does it sound like the right number to you? And if I want to sort of break it down like that, then they realize, oh, I'm on off, off, one off. But usually I find by that stage, they realize that there's this, this comfort level. Because we know where people that sit with us, I'm going to go build a house, you're not going to give the contractor a budget, and then I'm sitting here like in a vacuum trying to forget what you're going to spend. Yeah. So those clients sometimes can be a little bit tricky, but I find it's one of the first things you want to find out is how much are you willing to spend. And then the one thing we do with every budget, if the budget is 3x, we come in at exactly 3x. And I have an a la carte menu on the right hand side and say, these are the seven things that never made it into your budget. But this is what you asked me to do. This is what I've delivered to you. I hope you can find the appetite for one, three, and five, or two, four, and six, because those are big wow moments that we really need to tell your story. I think that's, that's it. Probably Thank it. you so much. Um, everybody.